forerunner in pushing us in directions, and they're challenging us now to have hip surgery replacements done outpatient. So that's the mode that we're in now. So you can imagine if you're a patient needing that surgery and you only have to go one place to see your physician, your surgeon, have your imaging, have your surgery, come back for follow-up care and physical therapy under one roof. That's very convenient. So uh, that's part of our plan. Um, the entitlements for the campus here were granted um, up to over 250 beds for the, the site here, but please understand that was always a planned program. So phase one is what we're putting forward now. And the entitlements allowed for a second patient tower and a third patient tower. And that's why you get up to the ultimate bed count of 300 beds that the property is entitled for. So I know there's been some confusion around, did we cut back on beds? No, the answer is no, we're doing the committed phase one of our plan. Um, and then phase two and phase three will follow as the population of Elk Grove continues to grow and we see the need is there for expanded services. Uh, we've done a, a diligent look at the population, growth trends, healthcare trends, disease incident, incidents, and we factored all of that into the model that is predicting around 100 beds to be the right size facility to service the community. Um, and that's based on a lot of the changes that we've just talked about with things moving to outpatient care. Um, we've seen advances such as our recent investment in an intuitive Da Vinci surgical robot. So we started a, a minimally invasive surgical robotic program in September of 2019 at Methodist Hospital. And that allows you to um, do surgeries with uh, less blood loss, um, less pain for patients. We have patients that aren't even, even taking medications after discharge uh, and just amazing results and shorter lengths of stay with that. So all that's factored into bed need and bed demand. Um, you'll see many more patients cared for at home with home health services or telemonitoring services at home and care where a patient comes to the emergency department and perhaps today they're admitted to the hospital for pneumonia and they have some um, therapy that's provided to them. Uh, you'll see more of that shifting present to the ED and be admitted to a skilled facility for a couple of days of therapy and monitoring and then sent home. So we're really looking to optimize the healthcare delivery system to ensure access to care and affordable access to care. Um, our community is pretty well serviced for trauma care. When you look at the level two trauma facilities that exist, and um, UC Davis is a level one trauma center. When you are a trauma center, you have a large service area that you're covering, um, 50 miles or greater. And we retain more than 90% of patients in our, in our community for trauma services. It's very rare that a patient is sent out. Um, and if they are, it's not because of lack of capacity. It might be for something very, very unique that they need. Uh, so we're playing the niche role as um, Dignity Health Methodist Hospital in servicing <coughs> South Sacramento, um, Elk Grove, Galt, and Wilton. That's our primary service area. And we meet the emergent care needs of the patients, stabilize, treat. If a patient's need goes beyond our capability, um, say they need um, open heart surgery, then because we're part of a strong system, we refer into our centers of excellence. So we would refer a patient needing open heart surgery to Mercy General, which is the largest heart surgical program um, in Northern California in the state and awesome results for patients. Uh, we would do similarly for patients that present for stroke. We care for stroke patients very well. We're a primary stroke center. Uh, but if a patient needs an interventional procedure, um, whether it's uh, a cranial surgery or just an interventional procedure, um, we would transfer to Mercy San Juan, which is our center of excellence for neurosurgical procedures. Um, similarly, for higher level NICU services, Mercy San Juan is our higher level for NICU, 
and we would transfer. And you see that within systems. Sutter has an element of that, Kaiser has an element of that, and that's part of the strength of being a system and having centers of excellence, ensuring access to care and affordability of care to the, to the residents in the community. So what I can tell you is, um, we have the entitlements since 2013, and we have been looking at um, growth trends in the community and needs, and then also coupling that up with the seismic standards that apply to hospitals in the year 2030. So right now, hospitals are under seismic standard requirements and will all withstand earthquakes, but the 2030 regulations require you to with you withstand a level eight earthquake, which is pretty massive, and you're fully capable to run operations for three days. So there's a lot that needs to be done, and um, there's a lot of advocacy around those requirements to see if they will loosen, because that is um, burdensome for hospitals. And you would also think that in that sort of a disaster, uh, a disaster zone, you wouldn't want to keep patients. You'd want to stabilize, treat, and transfer out of the area because roads and fires and everything else might be happening outside of the hospital. Um, but we can't count on that, and we've looked at what we need to do. And while we could retrofit Methodist Hospital, it would be costly to do that. And we think it's better served to utilize that capital to invest in what our vision was from the beginning, and that is to expand the campus here for a medical campus. Um, it will be a replacement facility for Methodist Hospital, and that's why we're so focused on the strength of our programs and services now. Um, we've just brought in our surgical robotic program. Um, we are a primary stroke center. Uh, a little over a year ago, we became accredited as a chest pain center. So those are investments in our services for care for emergent patients that are coming to the hospital, and they demonstrate our quality, and they demonstrate our commitment to efficiency and effectiveness for patients and their outcomes. And we do that because when we move our programs, we want to move from a position of strength. Um, we feature orthopedic surgeries. We're a center of excellence designated for orthopedic surgery. We're a center of excellence for bariatric surgeries as a center of excellence. And we also have um, family birth center services that uh, are designated as baby friendly. And we provide a lot of supportive services to our patients. We started a volunteer doula program a little over a year ago. And we have over 80 doulas now that we provide to patients at no cost to the patient. And a doula is um, a labor support individual. They don't um, practice clinical care. That is not their role to interface, but they're supportive to the mother with um, breathing techniques, encouragement, and support, because not every patient comes in with a support person that can help them through their labor process. So we're very invested in the strength of our programs and services. Um, we do that through the healthcare we provide. We do that through the community benefit we provide. Um, in the last fiscal year, we provided over $30 million in community benefit to Elk Grove citizens. And that happens through care we provide that is uncompensated or undercompensated for the cost. We also do that in investment of sponsorships with organizations that we partner with to make sure we're addressing all the social determinants that impact health needs, such as nutrition, healthy living style choices, um, you know, all those sorts of services and impacts. We do a lot also with our family medicine residency. And I like to say that's one of the little known facts about Methodist Hospital. We are a teaching hospital. We have a family medicine residency and we're training 24 physicians at any given time. It's a three year program, so eight physicians per year. And when they graduate from our program, we retain about 80% of the graduates right here who serve the community either as a hospitalist in one of our hospitals or setting up an office and providing primary care services to residents in the community. So we're very proud of our teaching mission and having a residency. And we also have a family medicine clinic where the residents see their patients and provide continuity of care. So that makes us very unique as a hospital that we have a residency, 
a clinic under our license for the acute care hospital, and we also have a distinct part skilled facility, which is Bruceville Terrace, and that's close to where Methodist Hospital is now. So it's a very nice continuum of services and part of our investment um, into the community. We will continue those um, programs into the future as the acute care service will relocate to a new hospital campus. We're pretty excited about being able to build a hospital. Um, as we looked at the population's growth and the impacts of seismic requirements, that led us to um, identify this is really the time to build the hospital now. And we also wanted to ensure we had our Dignity Health support at the corporate level to do this. Um, before we went out and publicly announced and communicated that. Uh, and we do have that support, and we're at the place now that we're very pleased to be able to share that with everyone. And we are on track with our plans. We have spent the past year working on um, what we call a bridging document. And that basically describes the size of facility, the number of beds, the types of services, and then we go through all the Oshkosh building codes that um, tell us what size the building needs to be for this kind of um, design. And that's where we came up with the fact that we'll be planning a 200,000 square foot building, which is actually bigger than our Methodist Hospital right now. It will have all private rooms for patients, convenience, but we'll also be able to design in very um, flexible care and um, approaches to care that meet that future trend. So even though we're talking about 100 beds, which is pretty close to what our uh, <laughs> census is now, but we anticipate the population will grow, that bed demand will go down as we shift to outpatient and we address length of stay. So we should be on par there. But we'll have additional treatment space in the hospital such as a dedicated observation unit that we're planning into the building. Um, those beds don't go on a hospital bed license count, so we'll have additional space within the facility to care for patients. Today, most observation patients are placed in an inpatient bed and taking that capacity away from an admitted patient, but we'll have flexible space, very similar to um, what an emergency department might look like, but it's a designed observation unit. Uh, we're also planning capacity in our family birth center for labor delivery and recovery rooms. And those beds are also not on your bed license, only postpartum beds are on your license. So we'll actually have more treatment space than just what the bed count might suggest. And it's designed with the absolute idea of flexibility for the emergency department, for observation care, and for procedural care. So we're pretty excited about the um, opportunity to do that and to have all private rooms for patients that support comfort and healing. Uh, we're very pleased to be able to do that. So that's a little bit about the project that I can tell you. I'd be very happy to address the uh, questions that maybe I didn't cover along the way, but I should also mention um, where we're at now in our planning is we've sent out an RFQ, that's a request for qualifications, to firms to be a design-build partner with us. And the design-build partner is the person that would do the actual construction and uh, oversight of the construction and the architectural design. Um, we anticipate having responses to the RFQ within the next few months and then narrowing that list down to maybe two or three potential vendors, and then submitting to them a request for proposal on our project, with the goal to select our firm by late summer or early fall of this year. That puts us on track to have our construction drawings done within the next year, 2021, to submit to Oshpod for their review and approval. And that's a process that you're never sure how long or how short it could take. Um, the cleaner your plans are, the faster it will go, and that will definitely be our goal. Uh, we would envision having approval from Oshpod and uh, be in a position to break ground around 2023 or 2024, and then open the new hospital uh, in 2026 or 2027. It does take about three years of construction 
um, to build a hospital the right way. And then of course you have to equip it and you have to have all the supplies in and then you invite California Department of Health in to actually license the facility and grant that licensure. Um, so our timeline is what you will see published um, by California Hospital Association. Most facilities from announcement to opening, it's a seven to 10 year process. Um, obviously, we're a little ahead of that because we've already done our bridging documents. We already had our entitlements. Um, so we do think by 2027, we'll be opening our hospital. I'm happy to answer any questions that you might have. That's yes. one of the questions when we're expecting to break down we are in the Denver community, which is less than half a mile from here. Mm -hmm. And uh, all of us are 55 now, so the sooner they come, the sooner we are here. <laughs> For us, too. <laughs> So, uh, yeah, by the way, I'm, as, as uh, someone who spent some time here, I'm hoping never to have to use any of the orthopedics. <laughs> I'm working hard not to have to, to visit any of those folks. But it, I, I am curious, uh, going back to the, um, because obviously you have a significant amount of experience in this area and, uh, in terms of location with respect to uh, needs of the community, and I think you articulated that pretty well. Um, I'm curious on the level two um, uh, trauma centers because it's been reported we need one and somehow servicing the I-5 corridor, whatever that means, because from my point of view, a significant part of the I-5 corridor is ag land and birds. So the question I have is, how does that actually work? From, 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 uh, I, I realize we have a level one trauma center at UC Davis and I don't think anybody's talking about that. My understanding was the level two trauma center at Kaiser is adequate to serve the, the South County immediate needs in terms of level two trauma centers. Um, but there's a suggestion that we need a third one, uh, at least to serve the I-5 corridor, and uh, I don't quite get that. Mm -hmm. yes, we, um, Kaiser South is a level two trauma facility. Um, Mercy San Juan, which is part of our daily system, is a level two trauma facility, and Sutter Roosevelt as well. So kind of have canvassing of the community. Um, and as I mentioned earlier, when you're a trauma center, uh, your primary service area is a much wider net um, because you need that to be able to um, have sufficient volume to offset the investment of being a trauma center. Uh, it is costly to have um, specialized equipment for that, but even more so to have physicians on call and readily available. There's a significant um, investment in being a trauma center and having staff available 24-7 for services as well. So it's, it's a very costly endeavor and that's why the county regulates that. So any hospital can't go out and claim they're going to be a trauma center, um, whatever level it is. Um, level, there's a level one trauma as well, which is a lower level. And we may pursue that um, for our facility. I'm but sorry, level one? Level one trauma. Um, I but level one was UC. I'm sorry, level three. I'm sorry. Level three. Oh, yeah. I'm sorry. Wait a minute. <laughs> sorry about that. Nick it goes just the opposite. Level yeah. three is the highest. But for trauma, level one is the highest. Yeah. Uh, but a county designates that. So you, you would apply for that. You would need to demonstrate um, your capabilities and so forth, and the county would determine if that's needed or warranted and if it will be granted. Um, I, I can tell you in talking to our counterparts in, in the area, um, trauma needs, as I mentioned earlier, are pretty well met with the system of delivery that we have in the Sacramento metropolitan area. I do believe over 90% of all trauma cases are, are handled right here locally and some might be sent out for some special, highly specialized mm -hmm. care. You said 50 mile radius, was that for UC uh, level one or is that for level two? Is there level a, two for trauma. It is 50 would, miles? Yeah, yeah 50 miles. Okay. I would need to confirm for level one, but I would imagine it's larger based yeah. on my prior experience. I was down in Fresno for 22 years um, as the COO at a level one burn and trauma center. And we considered our market Bakersfield 
all the way up to the south part of Sacramento, and that was in Fresno. And you need that large of um, a distance, again, for all the reasons I mentioned earlier. And Dignity Health has significant experience in planning new hospitals and planning services. We have 38 hospitals in California. We have hospitals in Nevada and Arizona. Um, and now that we have um, aligned with Catholic Healthcare Initiatives in January 2019, we're under Common Spirit Health as um, the umbrella organization. So Dignity Health and Catholic Healthcare Initiatives have come together and formed Common Spirit Health. You'll still know us as Dignity Health, and we are in the three states that Catholic Healthcare Initiatives are not in. Um, they're in 23 other states, so between the two of us, we're in 26 states of the nation, and we're the largest not-for-profit health system in the nation. And I think that really represents a lot of forethought of our leaders to position us for strength into the future. Um, we can advocate for legislation that benefits health care uh, without unduly burdening us and uh, you know, unduly placing restrictions on us that might impact access or affordability of care. Um, we think it also positions us well to lower the overhead structures of two separate organizations and economize that so that the hospitals individually are bearing less overhead costs than they would in a single system. So a lot of thought behind that and that we'll be better positioned to continue to reinvest in our facilities and our programs and our staff. Thank you. You talked about the different levels. Now, as an example, if I have an automobile accident, and, and this is back to your hospital, it's built here, mm -hmm. um, I could be brought here and, and stabilized, right? And then if it's really bad, they would then move me to a higher trauma center? Is that's, that how it usually works? That's correct. It would also depend on how you present it in the field mm -hmm. and the EMS um, classification right. system might place you as needing trauma care from the start and then you would be taken to the closest trauma facility that has that level of service. What about for, um, because I'm in that age group that they talked about, <laughs> <laughs> um, things like strokes and heart attacks, which is what we kind of have to look at more than what we like. Right. Um, would this, this facility be able to handle those kinds of things? Uh, yeah, and with our primary stroke center designation and our chest pain, pain center designation, yes, we do. We have um, ambulance receiving uh, patients that come in all the time. Mm -hmm. um, patients sometimes bring themselves in and don't come mm -hmm. via ambulance, and that's why we invested in being primary stroke and chest pain center so that we can respond timely and we have a system if we do need to transfer for care. If it's very obvious, depending on what the patient's conditions are in the field, and they know they're gonna need, need an immediate intervention, they'll take them to the closest right. interventional center. But other than that, yes, we would stabilize, treat. Mm -hmm. Something was mentioned that um, medical care is like a pendulum, and it swings from outpatient to more inpatient, back to outpatient to more inpatient. Now, I had shoulder surgery <laughs> last summer, and I can move my arm and everything's great, but, um, and it was done on an outpatient basis. I was home within four or five hours. And I know that in years past, people had to go into the hospital and stay there. And mine was relatively difficult. I mean, not only was the rotator cuff messed up, but the bicep was also, don't know how I did it. <laughs> That's what happens when you get old, I've been told. Um, <laughs> didn't like that part of it, but um, so do you see, I mean, has that been the way medical care has gone? I mean, do you anticipate that it's going to go back to everybody staying in the hospital five days to have a baby again? And Mm, absolutely. <laughs> absolutely. Now it's five minutes. <laughs> I think back in the 80s, there was a prediction that um, length of stay would drop way off and we would be way overbedded and, and stayed, and that did not happen. Mm -hmm. 
Um, but fast forward, and you, you see a lot more in terms of managed care happen and in, in Sacramento, we're a very managed care market. So you can't um, use East Coast bed demand predictions for how many beds per population and apply it here because our healthcare delivery system is very different. We have insurers and employers and hospitals that are aligned to manage care efficiently and effectively. So our length, length of stay is much lower. And we also look at um, different levels of service appropriately for the patient's needs. So you can't compare one region to another. But generally, um, things that have advanced to outpatient are going to stay outpatient, and you're going to see more of that trend happening, and you're going to see more things going home-based care. Um, and that will offset the aging of population that might otherwise you know, demand more bed use. Um, I, I really don't see us going back to long lengths of stay. Once something's converted, like cancer care, I mean, practically 95% of cancer care is outpatient, and that's not going to change. Mm -hmm. I'm glad you're doing well. I agree, Bobby. <laughs> if I would exercise more, I'd probably be doing better. <laughs> Maybe one of our surgeons did you care. No, actually, it was better, but oh, yeah. Okay. <laughs> Dr. Barad does a lot of our shoulders. Oh. Well, mine is retired, and so I may end up over here. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, um, following up on sort of the, this, this issue here, um, I noticed that uh, a number of the other care providers seem to have similar views in terms of size of uh, facilities that they're building, with a very notable exception with the wrong name. Um, <laughs> but the question I have is, is there sort of in the industry, and I realize each the uh, healthcare system has slightly, you're looking at different things and that's all great. Uh, but is there sort of a um, rule of thumb when you're looking at the population size in terms of beds to population size? I mean, obviously you seem to be building a, you know, 100 bed hospital now looking, I think we got 170,000, maybe go to 200,000, I don't know what the demographics are off the top of my head. But is there kind of a rule of thumb that just uh, just as a, as somebody who's a sort of a civilian looking at this stuff and trying to think through, because I hear what you're saying, it all makes total sense. Uh, but that, what I want to try to do is rationalize when I hear other numbers, like how could that possibly be? So is there sort of a rule of thumb that you and your counterparts and Kaiser or Sutter or other systems are, are, are kind of using? I mean, you would customize it to the local market. Yeah. I mean, generally California will represent a much different bed demand need than East Coast right. would. Um, and then you might see different regions of California based on the demographics of the population there, disease incidents for the demographic of that population influence that. So I wouldn't want to quote one blanket number, but I would say that you know, generally in our market, we're going to look at that similarly as healthcare experts um, would look at that. And we would use what makes sense for the population and the demographic here versus um, taking a bid demand to population from some other market. So, yeah, you just saw, I can interpret that for like what, I, what, I, what I'm trying to drive at here. So, you're looking at, uh, if I heard you right, uh, Elk Grove, South Sac, Dalton, kind of Dalton. East County area. And you're looking at age, number of people that are likely to live here in the next 20 years, mm -hmm. and that's what you're making to you. That's what you're using for your sizing decisions. And I would assume if I was in a similar, you know, discussion with people at Sutter, they would be kind of looking at the same thing. I don't know right. what market area they'd be finding, but I guess what I'm hearing, I'm hearing very similar things about the, you know, a, a number of uh, hospitals that I'm familiar with in terms of downsizing. And I, I understand that you can't use demographics in Chicago for what's happening here and you know uh, what Palm Springs needs versus here might be very different but it sounds to me I, I'm just kind of looking for like what are the things the factors that you're looking at in addition to population because you know, obviously it's a growing area but yeah. and disease incidents so we look at um, women of childbearing age and what is happening to child childbirth rates and then low weight babies and the need for um, neonatal services because we've seen that decrease in the state for very good reasons because we're better at prenatal care and maternity care and seeing less low weight babies who are requiring 
and ICU services. So we look at it uh, based on intensive care services that might be needed by the population based on age, by child-bearing um, age, by medical surgical trends and where healthcare is going for different procedures. So it's a, it's a lot of algorithms that we have out there that um, go into determining the de demand need. Thank you. And then the beauty of our campus is um, we can expand it and build it up to that full entitled bed count. So I do want to make sure that I've addressed that point that we've not cut back on the beds from the original entitlements. We're actually proposing slightly more beds than the phase one, um, and, and that will be phase one of a medical campus that could have a second and a third patient tower on our property and then a second medical office building as well. So the entitlements um, show that we have sufficient land and capability to meet the parking requirements and to have those structures of that size. So right now, since we have our um, uh, program design in terms of the services, we're going through the original entitlements and we're cross-checking to all of that. So we know that we fit within the entitlements and we have a very open working relationship with the city of Elk Grove. We've been meeting with them quarterly. We'll continue to do that and talk through our entitlements and our project plans. Do you anticipate when we might add the next two phases? You never know. Uh, I would say, you know, if I had to guess, I would say you're at least talking five to ten years out. Okay. So I, I just have a comment. So I was involved early in the process, and it made sense to me that even being stuck on emergency, I was looking at it over a 20-year period. And, and I'm trying to think back, but I thought that they had kind of some plans that we could look at, and they were talking about where they were going to, um, you know, plant everything on this on the, the acreage. And it was my understanding at that particular time that they're going to put a five-story. Um, parking garage to help accommodate some of the parking needs. Is that still a possibility? Well, actually, I only have two copies. <laughs> I apologize for that. But um, I can share this. This is the 28-acre parcel that we have here. And you'll see on here, um, the building is called MLB1. That's what we're in right now. And then um, this is Elk Grove Boulevard, so Costco is over here. And the housing is back here. Mm -hmm. And then this is the open green field um, on the other side of us. So this is where we're at right now. And this building, um, as I mentioned, okay. has yeah. two full floors operational <laughs> and the third floor we can build it out for surgeons' offices and physical therapy. So what we're building now is phase one of the design, so the three phases is the entitlement of the 300 beds. So um, you'll see that this was projected as four floors, and that's pretty much what we'll be building, is a four-story building. And then um, it's proposed that we could have two additional towers up to six floors if, in, if needed, that's what the entitlements allow. And then we have a second medical office building that would be closer to the housing other side of Civic Center Drive. So when you get to the point of building out all of this, mm -hmm. that triggers the need for a parking structure. Otherwise, surface parking satisfies that. Um, I don't believe it was a, a five-story. Uh, I want to say it was more like a, a three, but okay. I would have to check on that. Like I said, it's been a few years yes. since this was all presented. Um, now, is um, are you, you still considering building it to um, support Birth of Top um, Health Path? We do plan to have a health path okay. here, um, and we'll be working through the best place for that uh -huh. um, within the project and the entitlements. Okay. But since we would have um, an emergency department mm -hmm. here, mm -hmm. uh, we would plan the health path to be part of phase one. Originally, the concept was to have this more of a specialty um, surgery and maternity, mm -hmm. but we'll be having full service here. Um, and that's one thing I could also mention. Uh, it has come up in other conversations because we are part of the Catholic healthcare system. 
um, will the new hospital continue to function like Methodist Hospital does as a community-based, or will it be built as um, a Catholic hospital? Uh, it will continue as a community-based hospital, um, providing the same services that Methodist does in the community presently. And there are a few unique things that community-based hospitals do that Catholic sister facilities do not do. Um, so we will continue to carry that out. And about a third of the hospitals in Dignity Health in California are community-based. Mm -hmm. And Methodist was actually the very first one that came into what was Catholic College West in 1993 and then served as a model for how to affiliate other non-Catholic hospitals into the system. You're not near the last hospital I was familiar with was the University of Connecticut Health Center. Mm -hmm. So what is a Catholic-based hospital? I mean, I've never heard that term before. Um, well, we're part of the faith-based mm -hmm. health yeah. system. And um, to put it more simply, uh, the differences between services at a Catholic hospital versus a community-based, um, under the ethical and religious directives of the Catholic Church, um, we cannot participate in anything that creates life, like in vitro fertilization services, or mm -hmm. hastens life, like uh, physician suicide, uh, assisted suicide, mm -hmm. um, or would uh, end a life, like a termination uh, electively with pregnancy. Now, we as a community-based hospital, um, we follow the statement of common values, so we also would not do anything to create life or to hasten life, um, but we can do things such as elective sterilization procedures, and we do that to support patients. Um, and that would be probably the most notable uh, difference. But we treat all patients, um, and if a patient needs a service, we'll refer them uh, to a capable location or somewhere else on site. We work on things that are of concern to all of us, mm -hmm. such as um, behavioral health care needs, um, homelessness. Um, Trish, again, from Tiger South is working with us. They're interested in possibly um, contracting with Methodists for use of our Brewsville Terrace Distinct Heart Skills Beds. For the reason I talked about earlier, um, we have Kaiser members that uh, may have pneumonia and they um, would see it be a more effective model of care rather than admitting to an acute care bed, admit to a skilled bed, provide the therapy, the pharmaceutical therapy, and discharge back home for a couple of days. So we're collaborating along those um, those lines, which I think is really good. Do you also collaborate well with Shadow? Yes, we do all through the hospital council. We collaborate on issues of homelessness, behavioral health, that come forward that concern us all. Mm -hmm. Yeah, 
I, I'm not in my head yet because I'm, I'm trying to see if I know about that. And it was really, really nice that the house was done that. So I just have one other compliment. Sorry, I wish I had a family member that said Kaiser member needed sur some heart surgery. And so Kaiser and um, um, Mercy Dental mm -hmm. uh, together yes. with the contract. And I think that that's really efficient as far as um, the cost because equipment gets more and more expensive and having those things all available. So um, I, that, that's what I appreciate about the different um, health care providers that we have in the county. We have more time to focus on those together. So, and, and that's, I think, And the one other point I'd like to make is in reference to your question about bed need and that and that. Some states have um, what you call certificate of need. California doesn't have that. So in states that have certificate of need, if you're looking to expand or build a new hospital, you, you really have to go before a legislative approval process to demonstrate that need and gain that authorization. California doesn't have that process, so really it's beholden on us to make wise decisions um, in our investments because it is very costly to um, build a hospital and build beds and equipment and, and staff. Our project we're projecting with inflation at um, 327 million. Is this retail? Yes. So um, the uh, we, we have a medical school here, as CMU does, uh, and I understand that, they're, uh, that uh, the, the physicians coming out of there are currently doing their post-education uh, in health at uh, various hospitals. Are, are they any of them in the Methodist system now? Or? Yes, okay. I, I sign agreements um, weekly for our medical students to go to their facility. And okay. They take through um, our other health systems in the community as well. Thank you, Sandy. Yes. Okay, and, yeah. Mm -hmm. And that can happen with residents as well. So this would not be an inconvenient location. Okay, good. No. And our residents um, from Methodist, our family medicine residents, we rotate them to Mercy General. Um, so they get a little different intensive care experience there. And then we also rotate them to Mercy San Juan so that they can be in the pediatric experience because we don't have a pediatric unit. So you don't have to have everything in your facility or even have a facility, you just have to have a location for um, that experience base. Thank you. I've appreciated the questions. Yeah. <laughs> it's really good to go to a meeting and getting straight answers for once. So I really appreciate that. Thank you everybody for Please keep it up because I think there's a lot of confu confusion in the community about all of this, and I think the fact that you have the track record that you have, and the fact that you actually have something real for people to look at and ask questions, and are pretty straightforward in terms of answering what are, um, you know, 
the basic questions but good ones that I appreciate it so your time is being well spent whether there's you know half a dozen of us or 60 uh, thank you thank you can, can, can I have a keep your secret plan or do you need it back <laughs> Let's do this. I'm hoping, like I really like the design of this building and the solar parking and all that. So I'm hopeful that the community will be as attractive as it is. And then I just wanted to push back for this project, and I don't know that you were involved in the early days. I think from the neighbors around that area when this particular area was rezoned for the hospital. So some of the concerns that phase one structure might be a little different. Maybe it'll look like an L and not a square, but it yeah, might fit within the major concept. Because this, this was done twice, and then we have those ugly apartments across the street, which were really disappointing. <laughs> <laughs> I talked to the, the gal that was involved in this, and she said she was equally disappointed when I started complaining about the place where I can watch. Because this is um, a beautiful place. Thank you. Well, thank you all for attending.